my friend, we've jumped up again. You try, but we won't give in. We're proud of our brown skin. Try again. We can't let you in. Oh, yes, we have fought your wars and died on the that we did before. We've attended your bias and we live by your rules. Pretend we'll be But don't tell me that we're fighting to be free. We're living in the ghettos, we got us on our knees. Hey, don't you know, from the rise to the rise, there's an angry giant rising, you're no longer fooling me. My friend, we jumped up again. But don't 
tell me that we're fighting to be free when we're living in the ghettos. We got us on our knees. Hey, don't you know? From the rising to the rising, there's an angry giant rising. You're no longer fooling me. My friend, we jumped up again. You try, but we won't give in. You lie from your marble halls. While you build your walls, your immortal walls. So don't you creep. Equal opportunities. We lock our kids in cages and they're crying to be free. Hey, don't you lie. Welcome, welcome, and thank you to the 50th Chicano Moratorium Webinar Education Series. Uh, we are going to be coming to you every day this week leading up to the August 29th, 2020, 50th anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium. And we will also be joining you one extra day on August 30th for um, a very um, powerful uh, documentary that we are um, going to be uh, screening about the Brown Berets at the Chicano Moratorium by Higher Ground Productions and Indio Inc. Productions. That'll be on Sunday, August 30th. Um, today we have a really just a powerful um, panel of speakers that are coming to you from various um, organizations, including uh, Centro CSO in Boyle Heights, Union del Barrio, which is in Los Angeles and also in San Diego. We have um, several um, of our leaders in the labor movement here in, um, in Los Angeles that are, that are gonna be with us. We have Genaro and Ernesto Ayala of La Raza Unida who will be here with us as well, and um, several youth organizers. But before we, um, before we get into all of that, I, um, I just wanted to remind folks that we are going to be here we are going to be having two options to commemorate the 50th uh, Chicano Moratorium. Um, the first one is gonna be a car caravan. And um, you can see right now um, across the screen, it gives you the, the information about where we will be starting um, at nine o'clock in the morning on August 29th um, in uh, Pico Rivera on Greg Road and on uh, Whittier Boulevard, historic Whittier Boulevard. That's for the car caravan at 9 a.m. But those who want to march, there will be a march as well. We're going to be together, but it's two options. And the march is going to begin at Atlantic Park on Atlantic and 6th Street in East Los Angeles. And um, the, the caravan and the march are going to converge. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's going to converge at Atlantic and Whittier Boulevard and then proceed down Atlantic and Whittier Boulevard in a beautiful um parallel fashion all the way down to Salazar Park where there will be a post rally. And so we, we hope that the community comes out and joins us um, in our social distancing march or our social distancing um, car caravan. But um, before we bring our panel out to talk today about uh, why being a part of an organization is important to the Chicano movement, let's go ahead and invite up um, at one of our, um, our members who is also um, a poet. So today we are blessed to have a um, presentation, a poetry presentation, a spoken word presentation by Matt Cedillo. So let's welcome Matt Cedillo. My, um, once again, it looks like I'm having some, uh, some Wi-Fi issues. So my face is frozen, but I'm here. And, um, and I'm going to go ahead and bring uh, Matt Cedillo, who um, has been called the Poet Laureate um, of the Chicano movement of today. Of course, we've had many amazing uh, Chicano poets um, along the way, including, um, you know, Luis J. Rodriguez and others. But I'm gonna go ahead and add right. Right, Matt Cedillo. Thank you, Matt, for being with us. 
Well, thank you for having me and for your kind comments. Um, so I just wrote this half an hour ago, which either speaks to, uh, you know, if it's good, that, that, that looks good on me. If not, <laughs> no excuses. Here we go. I wrote this particularly for, uh, for on topic, uh, for the importance of organization and, and why it is so important to organize uh, for, for the Chicano movement and just uh, for, for anyone uh, looking out there to struggle against the conditions they find themselves in. Uh, organization is key. Here we go. Um, some say it is a process, not an event. Some say revolution begins within. Some say it has already begun. Some carry signs, some sign petitions, some wait on conditions, some say within our lifetime, some block politicians, some back politicians, some become politicians, some say impossible. And I have seen academics, metaphysics swallow reality. And I've seen the organizers of labor embrace capitalist parties. And I have seen cowardice, dishonesty, careerism parade as groundbreakingly new. And I have seen courage burst into spontaneous flame. I have seen fear in the pig's eye. And I have seen rebellions light the night sky then fade to smoke. Some say there is no need to organize. Some speak against the need for political education. But I know that theory there can be no revolution. And once the line is set, organization is key. And I know there are decades to be wrenched from weeks and I do not wait upon the impossible. None can do it alone. Every day we work to make victory inevitable. If we wish to see revolution within our lifetimes, we must organize, organize, organize. Wow, thank you, Matt. That was beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you have um, another poem that you can share with us before we get off later today? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can I can come back and, and do some more stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, thank you so much, Matt. Um, so now I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna invite some of the panelists that are gonna be here with us today. I'm gonna um, go ahead and bring up right now um, members of, of an organization from San Diego and Los Angeles, Union del Barrio. So first I'm gonna go ahead and bring up Benjamin Prado, Ron Gochet, I will bring up Jocelyn Ruiz and Desiree Gaitan. And so, um, welcome, comrade. How are you? Good evening, comrade. So I'm going to go ahead and um, and put up our first question and um, and invite you all to go ahead and respond to this. So um, I, I already can announce it, but what organization do you belong to? Where is this org based, and what is the objective of your organization? <laughs> So, you know, I think uh, as Union del Barrio, we were founded actually from the Chicano movement. We, in fact, were founded on August 29th, 1981, about 11 years after the 1970 Chicano moratorium. And it was a response to the political assault, to the uh, military assault on the Chicano power movement of the 1960s and 1970s. And we say this because, uh, during the 1960s and 1970s, we saw our movement attacked with the Point Pro, saw our movements attacked by with the counterinsurgency uh, policy of the United States government to neutralize and politically disable, disarm our people uh, and join the ranks of the Democratic Party, to join the ranks of a lot of these uh, established political parties and our struggle, our fundamental struggle as a people, as a community, as an organization is to build the concept and advance the concept of raza self-determination, which has five basic elements. Number one, collectively interpret our history. Two, control our economic destiny. Three, advance our social development by self-directing our culture, education, and language. Four, independently develop the content, character, and direction of our political orientation. And five, control the political institutions that make the laws that govern us. So Union del Barrio was born from a history and legacy of struggle that we, we embrace, not only the Chicano movement, 
but the indigenous anti-colonial struggle that began in 1492 against settler colonialism on our continent. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, Ron, do you have anything to add to that? Um, Ron, well, or the other comments? Yeah, um, thank, you for, thank you for inviting us. You know, for us, organization is key. And I think that one of the major lessons that we learned from the Chicano power movement era is the need for organization. You know, we had masses of people participating in church back in the day, but the ones who did who did the most and had the most impact were those that are part of organization. And I think that's what we have today. You know, a lot of people today say that it's not about being an organization anymore. It's just about being conscious and things like that. But we reject that. We say it's all about being part of an organization because only through an organization can we reach the maximum capacity of political power. And that's what this is all about. This is about political power. You know, in the Chicano power movement, people talked about, uh, you know, this being Aslan and the concept of, of Aslan being stolen from us. We believe that. We believe that our land was stolen from us. And as indigenous people, we said that the, the land that was stolen from us, we have to get it back. But unless we have a real serious plan and the science and the strategy to get your land back, um, then, and then really it'll be just rhetoric. That's why today we continue the, the challenge. We challenge people. That if you really believe in the ideals of the Chicano power movement, of, of the movement, right, the movimiento, then you have to be part of an organization because no matter how amazing one is individually, you cannot do as much as an organized force. And that's why it's important that our people are, are join organizations, are accountable to organizations, because if you're not accountable to an organization, then you can struggle on any given day if you feel like it. You know, you can do whatever you want or not do whatever you want, and you're not accountable to anybody. That's why it's so important for us uh, to join organizations. You know, our organization is one of them. There are many others that people can join, but we're talking about, uh, to be very blunt, the socialist reunification of our homeland. And that means we have a, a, a program, we can govern ourselves. We're not just talking about rhetoric, but we actually have a plan to have capacity for our people to take back what was stolen from us and for us to govern ourselves. You know, 50 years ago, our ancestors taught us to not support the Democratic Party. But today we still have some people who call themselves Chicanos who are saying that we should support the Democratic Party. You know, so that tells us that we still have a long, long way to go. And as we celebrate the 50 years of struggle since the Chicano moratorium, uh, we have to understand that the movement is far from over and we need everybody today to continue to struggle. Whether you call yourself a Chicano or Chicana, it doesn't matter. Just join the movement, uh, organize and defend our people because our enemy is strong, our enemy is organized, and our enemy is hoping that we're not organized. That's why we have to join political organizations. And just to add one final note, you know, sometimes we wait for people to come into our communities and, and do the work for us. And so part of what we're doing is saying, like, you know, no one's going to come here and say, well, we have to, you know, put away and, like, organize in order to see the changes that we want to see. So we can't just rely on politicians, right? We have to organize ourselves because, you know, the Democrats, the Republicans, you know, all these different politicians, they're not going to come to our neighborhood to make them better for us. You know, so we have to be the ones to really be out there at the, at the forefront and really, you know, do the change that we want to see for our own communities. Thank you, thank you for that, Jocelyn. Can you also share a little bit about um, some of the organizing that you did with um, Mecha the UCLA? Um, yeah, so I think also part of why I joined the Union del Barrio was because you know I was in Mecha when I was in college, and so it was kind of like the same thing, right? I, uh, I wanted to be sure that I was involved on my campus at UCLA, that I was accountable to a group fighting for change for students on campus. Um, and really to, to be able to to carry out that kind of work, right? Like, you know, uh, campus wasn't providing us with the resources that we needed. Um, they weren't providing the services uh, or going into like the communities that they're supposed to serve in the greater Los Angeles area. So as the chief says, we, we made sure that we had uh, different kinds of services um, by, you know, building together a youth, pro a youth program that we rebuilt where we'd bring, you know, students from high schools uh, in LA and in Compton to UCLA to learn how to be community organizers and then go back into those spaces. Um, so so that, that kind of came that accountability uh, from like 
at the university level. And once I was ready to leave college, I wanted to make sure that I was still accountable to a group, to a force, to people um, that ultimately held me down and grounded me in the work that I, you know, that I committed my life to. Um, and so, you know, joining Union de Barco was kind of that next, next step was, right? Like, so a lot of college students kind of, you know, are activists, or student organizers while they're in college, and then, you know, we move on to get our careers or, you know, what have you. And so part of joining an organization is to, 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 to keep that same accountability. Um, that even after college, the fight doesn't stop, right? And we can we, we want to have as many people organized as possible. And uh, Compa Desiree, I believe you were uh, saying something, if you were muted. Yes, Compa, thank you. I was muted. Um, to not be repetitive with what my comrades have already described of our organization, I, I would say that uh, part of our objective is also to align ourselves with all oppressed people of the world, right? Not just Nuestra America, the continent of the Americas, but seeing ourselves as indigenous people whose land was stolen, um, but of all working class people, right? Um, I think specifically, which is extremely relevant to this panel and the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Chicano moratorium, right? An anti-Vietnam war movement where, you know, we, we see the contradiction in brown people, brown folks from these continents, you know, going to fight other brown working class poor people in, in another part of the globe. And so I think that's an important point to uplift, right? That we see ourselves as, as an extension arm and in solidarity with all working class people. Thank you, Desiree. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and welcome um, uh, two members um, of the labor movement here in Los Angeles um, about some of the work that they do around organizing uh, workers here in Los Angeles. So I'm gonna invite um, Hector Aguilar from uh, ILWU Local 26, and also um, Miguel Vigil Lopez, Retired um, teamster. I'm having issues getting them in, but give me just a second. Lupe, do you just want me to get started? I can't hear you, so I'm just gonna go ahead. Please, and yeah, go ahead awesome. and please get started. Yeah, thank you. My name is Hector Aguilar, I'm uh, treasurer of uh, Local 26 ILWU. Um, we're uh, um, a local that it's part of the Longshore uh, Division, the Longshore Union, but we're the Warehouse Division. And um, a little history of our local, we were founded in the 1930s. And uh, one of our forefathers, one of the, the, the real leaders of our organization was Bert Corona, um, who, um, as you guys all know, um, has had a significant impact on the Chicano movement. And he was one of our first presidents. Um, and so, um, our, organization represents warehouse workers and the i guess objective that we have is to um make sure we give the working people um a voice a voice in a, a part of a i think it's part of a bigger bigger uh, struggle and i think some of the uh, comrades uh, touched on it um there's certain oppressive forces i think um that make people in general all people Think that they're no good. Maybe they're too, too this, too that, too brown, too dumb, too lazy, whatever. And those are, you know, exploitive or oppressive forces. And uh, capitalism has a tendency to be exploitive and to take advantage uh, uh, of working people. And so the role and the main objective of our organization is to give people a voice um, on uh, on the job sites while they're working and represent them. Thank you, Hector. So Miguel Vigil Lopez, can you share a little bit with us about um, what your organization of the team says? Hector, are you there? Did he freeze up or is he finished? No, I think he I think he's frozen. Oh no, he's done. You're good, Miguel. It's me that's frozen. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Miguel. You're good. Miguel? We can hear you, Miguel. Um, well, I guess I'll just go ahead then, right? Yes, please go.
Okay, my name is Miguel Vigil Lopez. Um, you know, currently I'm a Teamster retiree. That's an association that I'm part of, but I don't really claim any one organization, uh, mainly because I've been in so many. Uh, right now I'm sporting the 50th anniversary of the Plan de Santa Barbara, which brought me into the movement when I was a young teenager, student, uh, activist, and um, I uh, pretty much was part of the whole process back from the 60s. Uh, I was in UMAS, United Mexican American Students. We had the fight to change it to match. We got, we did. Eventually, I, uh, I joined the Brown Berets. Uh, we organized a centro in our city in Norwalk. It was called the Centro Aslanda Norwalk. I became a member of the La Raza Unida Party for the same reasons for some of these young people talked about the capitalist uh, political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Those are pretty much the ruling class parties. So there's no need for us to be part of that. We've made an effort to start to become part of a, of a party. But of course, they have it wired for their way that no other party can participate. So we have to kind of organize independently. Um, eventually, I, I uh, became part of an organization called the Committee to Free Los Tres. Three brothers from the Boyle Heights area were fighting drugs in their community. Um, and we had to free them. They did a number of years in prison because of that. They shot a pusher who happened to be a federal agent. And there's a longer story to it, but that, that's where I was. At that same time, I joined the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Uh, I'm a, from a working class family, uh, and I understand the benefits of being part of an organization. Uh, that was actually the question uh, that we're having. Why is it vital to uh, be part of an organization? Uh, you can't do anything alone. You have to collectively organize for your interests, whatever your interests are at that particular time. Organizations evolve and they develop based on uh, the needs of the people who become part of them to advocate on their behalf. So even after uh, joining the Teamsters, I continued working under the leadership of Bert Corona at the Centro de Acción Social Autónoma. It was called CASA back in the days. We were uh, advocates of the defense of the immigrant workers, uh, trying to teach people that our people are the working class. We're not a separate class. We're part of the working class. There's two classes, the ruling class and the working class. And so for us, that was where our, our home was, uh, defending our people. And one of the things that Bert uh, taught us, along with uh, being part of MAPA, Mexican American Political Organization, was that somos un pueblo sin fronteras. We are one people without borders. We've been here way longer than everybody. We're still here. And we're going to be here when these fools leave. So uh, that was that was our thinking uh, back in those days, and we still believe that. Uh, even people that I work with who are, happen to be part of the Democratic Party. They cannot dispute that. They cannot dispute that our people are part of the working class movement. So um, after CASA had its demise in the late 70s, we, uh, we all kind of gathered into Hermandad Mexicana Nacional. Uh, my brother, rest in peace, uh, was one of the leaders and one of the, the warriors of our people where nobody wanted to go into Orange County. And my brother did that. And he changed the face of Orange County in a lot of ways, uh, heading up Hermandad Mexicana in Santa Ana. Uh, we also participated in the 2006 Day of an Immigrant, in which we flooded the whole city of Los Angeles and many cities throughout the country. We hope someday we will be able to massively come out in the same way again. And that takes organization. That takes uh, us learning how to mobilize our people. Um, after that, I, of course, became part of the Chicano Moratorium, 50th anniversary. I was 17 years old when we marched in East L.A. and fought the cops. Um, and um, so eventually, continuing to work, building my family, I became a substitute teacher in my school districts here, where I live in Norwalk and uh, Pico Rivera. And um, I am now known as the teacher, the Cisa Puede teacher, because I open every class with the Cisa Puede refrain and explaining where it came from and how our people are the ones that feed the, the, the world. The, the Mexican people, we feed the world. Not only have we contributed some of the best foods in history, we've also continued to plant and grow and, and provide it 
to everybody in the world. So we have real high value, but yet they devalue us on a daily basis because of their racism and because of their fascism in the sense that they have a cabal that's trying to control everything and keep us out. And uh, we're not going to stay out. We're going we're, we're gonna to be, be heard. And we're going to continue to move forward. So the best thing I can say here at the, at the end is that uh, organizations evolve and develop. You're not going to always be part of the same organization. You may be part of more than one organization. But the key is learning skills and social contact and social experiences with each other while you're in an organization. And this way, if you choose that you have to leave for some reason, like ideological reasons or personal reasons or whatever, when you go to the next level, you will have those skills ready to move forward and help others, mentor others into the organizations that we create as we continue the struggle. And so one of the things I'm going to finish, I'm going to close by saying this. One of the things I learned from Bert very, very much back in the 60s, our successes as a people are based on our self-determination and our learning to succeed, to represent our people at whatever level it is. So when we're out there educating ourselves, working, whatever in the labor movement or in the community-based organizations or in the student movements, um, the best that we do to represent our people, that's where our successes are. Because now I see young people on this screen right now who are the next generation to continue the fight and take the leadership. And uh, I have great respect for the young people and the energy that they're providing today. You know, and you guys have learned well. Okay, and um, we want to be there for you and to continue to fight and, and, and mentor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Miguel. And I'm going to go ahead and now invite um, Brian uh, and Ms. Kumayana to the studio. So, uh, I have a question to us from the La Raza Unida party. And so, um, we're very uh, appreciative that the two of you are here with us today. And so, we have the same question for you. Gracias, Ernesto is um, what organization you belong to, like where, where is the org based and uh, what is the objective of, of your organization? Oops. Okay, the, the objective, I, I am, my name is Genaro Ayala. I have been involved with La Raza Unida since 1970. The objective of, of the organization of La Raza Unida is basically to make sure that people understand that this is our land, that people understand that there's no other way that we can that we can liberate and have self determination and liberate our our land, but to organize. This country has been very effectively uh, sectioning off our history to confuse our people and and to make them wonder or make them or push them towards the Democrats or the Republicans. So we want to make sure that our people understand that the only power that's going to be uh, big enough, that's going to be is strong enough to, to, to move forward. Our, our movement is to have our own political party. We have seen, we take our history in, in a straight line. Our history is not sectioned off in, in uh, it's the little sections from one point to the other. It's, 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 a, it's a history that, that has been building from the moment that that this country was in, that, that our homeland was invaded and that our homeland was occupied. Uh, we have been organizing as the and ev evidence of that is, is, is the, uh, Joaquin Murrieta, Tiburcio Vasquez, Chano Cortina. And then we move on to, to, to the Zuzu period and, and as the, which culminated, that period culminated with, with the, the Chicano power period. And we see that. We see as the Corky uh, Gonzalez as being very instrumental in our movement. We are a movement. We're not just an organization that happens to pop up uh, out of nothing. We're an organization with a history. And, and at every step, 
with Corky, with Jose Angel, with, 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 uh, with all the movements that have occurred in, in Texas, in Arizona, in New Mexico, related to La Raza Unida, we have been building the organization. Uh, the Chicano Moratorium, the 1970, 1970 is a very important uh, period, basically, because that's the period where we see the, the fruits of our movement, the fruits that, that the farm workers laid out, the fruits that, that the communities across the Southwest, across our, our homeland laid out in, as they're becoming a reality with, with the organizing of our own political party, with the organizing of, of a strong student organization under Mecha, Movimiento Estudiantil, Chicano de Aslan, uh, as, uh, and, uh, as the organizing of, of higher education, organizing of Chicano studies. As the, so it's very important to, to understand those steps and understand who it is that we are. We, we see our, our situation, or we see our, as our main uh, purpose is to organize our people in the community. We have we understand that we need solidarity with with Mexico and we need solidarity with Latin America and we need solidarity with other revolutionary movements across the world. But one of our main efforts has to be to organize our people. But if we don't organize our people, then we we we're not going to achieve that liberation that we that, that we are that we have struggled for for more than fifty years. I know we're commemorating the 50 years of, of the Chicano Moratorium. We are also commemorating the 50 years of the Partido Nacional de la Raza Unida, but we have to move it forward we, as an organization, not as not jumping from organization to organization, but as one organization moving towards our self-determination and our national liberation as Chicanos, Mexicanos, as Raza. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for that, Genaro. Um, Ernesto, do you have anything that, that you would like to share as well? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, you know, like just you know, Ray, what what, uh, what uh, my father said, or that, and some of the what the other compañeros have said, or that, you know, we need to be organized. You know, we're talking about liberation. We're talking about self determination. We're talking about building, you know, a, a new society. You know, a lot of a lot of people nowadays, and uh, compañero Ron said it, but uh, a lot of people nowadays think it's just a matter of being conscious or being, you know, quote unquote woke. Sometimes right. that's not even being conscious at all. You know, and and that's that's nothing. You know, to to make uh to make change, to make the the changes that that, that we're that we're working on, that requires power, and and to have power requires organization, people, you know, organized, going in one direction. Right? Um, towards one goal, and that's what we need to remember. Right? That's the only way we've been able to change anything throughout our history is that organization. You know, uh, why why did we win? You know, even though they're being erased and they were they weren't exactly what we wanted, but we won certain rights is because we were organized. Why did the labor movement win? Because they were organized, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they had goals and they and they did what they could to meet them. You know, so we need to think in the same mm -hmm. manner. Without the, the an organization, the partido, that. Is a, is a is a tool is a weapon of, of our of the masses of the raza, you know. Um, so so yeah, you know, it's one of that at that with that. As far as to where we're based, you know, our main base is here in San Fernando, Pacoima. Uh, we've been here uh, nonstop since 1971. Este, uh, uh, compañeros in Nuevo Mexico, some in Texas, and Portland, Oregon, and, and supporters throughout California. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, now I'm now going to uh, invite Sol Marquez. And Lucia Torres, thank you for being here with us, Lucia and Son. And, and essentially, the, the same question for you: um, What organization do you belong to, and where is the organization based, and what's the objective? Sol, you can go first. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Marisol Marquez. I go by Sol, and uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you on here. And um, you know, uh, I belong to an organization called Centro Community Service Organization or Centro CSO. And uh, we're based out of Boyle Heights in East LA. We primarily work in this area, but uh, we have been known to go to a lot of other places like Rialto, Fullerton just last week. Uh, we sometimes hang out in South Central. 
Uh, and you know, it's wherever somebody asks us, asks us to go, we, we try to spread out and, and be there. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we do um, lately has been around uh, people like Jesse Romero, 14 year old killed by LAPD Hollenbeck here in Bowl Heights. Uh, but you know, we're, we're united with everything that's going on around the 50th Chicano Moratorium. It's important, it's great that all of you are speaking about the self-determination needed by Chicanos today because that's exactly what is needed, right? We, we need to win and fight for liberation. And uh, that can't be done if we play nicely, right? Because we know what that can get us, uh, not much. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we, we have to stand up and fight back, but also organize within our, our neighborhoods where we live. Uh, you can't really, you know, attack the, the belly of the beast if you're not rooted in your own community or your own neighborhood. Uh, I live in Boyle Heights and um, I've been here for five years. But, um, you know, wherever we try to be, we try to make sure that we can organize the fight against uh, people like the police. And also, um, you know, sometimes politicians stand in our way so we can also attack them kind of like Trump. I hate to mention his name right now, uh, but, you know, they're they're part of the same kind of uh, position. Right. And, and some of us refer to it as the state. So um, you got to take people where they're at. You got to meet them where they're at. If they're on the streets fighting back, then go to the streets and fight back with them. Uh, and, you know. I, I would say that uh, that's one of our important uh, struggles within CSO. And uh, the mission of CSO for sure is to fight, like I said, against police brutality. We also do a lot of work against uh, privatizing efforts on education. Uh, what happened, um, I, it's like a perfect example, but um, charter schools started off being privatizing or privatizers here uh, on this side of the country, uh, in Aslan or the West Coast, as some people call it. And uh, now they've taken over complete districts over, uh, all over the country, right? Uh, for example, Hurricane Katrina ravished um, what is Louisiana. And um, uh, you know, now there's not a single public school in New Orleans. And so you know, that's, that's obviously a problem if you have a disaster, a natural disaster happening, uh, who comes in, right? It isn't somebody who's gonna save the community, who's gonna save the neighborhoods. They're gonna come in and try to privatize as much as they can. Uh, it's a perfect opportunity who has the money to be able to build from the ground up and that's privatizers and so it's it's a very sad reality that we face um and so cso has taken that on in boyle heights because we we have constant threat uh in this small neighborhood uh with people trying to or organizations and charter schools trying to come in and attack uh and um you know we we understand that this attack is very much on on chicanos and boyle heights it is pr primarily raza who lives here uh, hardly do you see anybody else who isn't Rasa. Uh, we also know that there's a lot of Japanese Americans from, from the times of the war uh, that ended up in this area. So, you know, the, the, this is the people who is primarily under attack. It's primarily a working class community. So, you know, we have to be there and, and fight back when we, when we can. Uh, to be honest, I didn't even know about the charter school stuff um, until I moved to Los Angeles. I, I didn't know it was this big of a problem. Uh, and, you know, also because a lot of our, our members of CSO are uh, people who have um, either, you know, in between status or, or are undocumented. We also, of course, fight back against um, discrimination based on the undocumented. Uh, we try to push legalization for all of the undocumented. Uh, no person is illegal, right? My parents came from Mexico, and uh, nobody gave them gave them permission to come over. Uh, they they did it in many ways, right? So. These are some of the fights that we're involved in. And of course, uh, we make it our, our number one priority to make sure that we can win as much as we can on the way. Thank you so much, Sol. Um, and I'd like now to, to bring Lucia Torres, Torres up. Share with us. Hi, uh, my name is Lucia Torres. I'm part of CSO Core and the new CSO Youth Chapter. And I was appointed to work with other youth in order to promote turnout for the 29th. And we've transformed into a branch of CSO we're calling ourselves CSU, and we're very strictly digital right now, especially during the virus, but also like we're youth oriented. So we're on Instagram, all that. Um, <laughs> we're calling, or well, we're calling ourselves CSO Youth, right? Our Instagram is CSO Youth. Um, we're made specifically for the new Gen Z millennial group of activists. And our main goal is to create a safe space for the new generation of Rasa movement and to help the movement grow and evolve with the times but especially to validate the voices of young activists and those youth who want to get involved. Um, besides youth turnout for the 29th, we want to focus on educating on voter registration because personally, I'm 17. Um, nobody ever told me how to vote. They told me that my vote mattered, but nobody bothered to educate me on how to vote, how to register. So we're focusing on that, we're focusing on how to get active from your home 
And especially, I understand that not everybody is as privileged as I am, and our group is to go out and protest, to physically be there. Not everybody can donate money, so we're focused on other ways to promote change, especially from the home, and how to educate your elders because the Chicano community and the Raza movement are very based on their elders. Mm -hmm. And I've seen lately that a lot of the elders are very reluctant to pass down the torch. So we're here to help the movement evolve because I, I am a queer Chicana and I know that that was not supported not too long ago in the movement. And mm -hmm. I'm so glad to be here and to be able to help evolve the movement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lucia. To be honest, um, having you here and sharing those words actually gives me hope. So thank you. I know that the movement is in good hands. And so we um, we need to really support one another to keep it going forward. Um, I have one more guest that I'm going to bring okay. up. Fabian Pavon. Pavon. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Let me. I don't think. Oh, yeah, you're good. You're good. Um, thank you, Fabian, for being here. Um, let us know, like, what, what type of organizing are you doing in Pomona, in the Pomona area? What's going on over there? Yeah, so um, I do all kinds of different work. I'm a part of all kinds of different organizations. Uh, I'm currently a board member of the Latina Latino Roundtable of the San Gabriel and Pomona Valley. And so uh, some of the work that they've done, you know, I'm really blessed. You know, it's a lot of, it's led by, like, a lot of veteranos, like, like Dr. Jose Calderon. And, and Angela Sambrano and, and all kinds of folks like that. So they're passing down all of their knowledge to me. So I feel really, you know, I, I feel really lucky that, you know, they would do that with me, you know, that organization on its own, uh, you know, they've, they've fought against uh, checkpoints. They, they, they help legalize street vendors. Uh, they had, they played a big role in AB, in passing AB, um, AB, uh, I think it's uh, AB 60. Yeah. The one that allowed, uh, you know, some folks who are undocumented, uh, the right to have a license so that, that was some of uh some of the what the work that the organization itself did uh me i'm focusing more on, on education and specifically ethnic studies and so we started a movement here in pomona uh we started the pomona education coalition with latino roundtable all kinds of other organizations as well in pomona and and we've been really pushing for ethnic studies uh for a requirement for it to be integrated uh across the curriculum the k-12 through curriculum we're also pushing to extend the vote uh, to youth and non-citizens and within school board elections, so that, that way they can have a voice when it comes to school board elections as well. And so, I mean, we've been, uh, I mean, I did a march, we did a protest and, and you know, we, we, we've we been we've been pressing them during public comments and, and it looks like they're finally talking about it. We told them, hey, we're gonna use, we're gonna use elections to our advantage. If you don't, you know, we're gonna be paying attention. If you don't put this stuff on your next agenda, we're gonna remember that, you know? So it's just little, little stuff like that. I also do, I'm also the chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission, and I've taken like a real, um, I've taken like a real, I, I, I use like a, like a critical race uh, framework when I, when I do that type of stuff. So like, uh, particularly the, the parks that I'm in charge of, uh, as a, as a commissioner for Parks and Recreation, you know, it's, it's where I grew up, uh, born and raised city of Pomona. And, and these particular parks, they're located in historically redlined neighborhoods. So these, these, the parks that I represent, they, you know, they've been, they've been tampered with. They've been, um, they've, they've already been set at a disadvantage. You know, the only reason why we have some of the parks is because in the, in, in the, in the late sixties, our community organized to turn empty lots into parks, just like similar history at Chicano park. And so uh, I just, I, you know, I, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about why organizing is important. And so um, at the, so basically like at the root of this nation, you know, from the, from its declaration of independence to its constitution, uh, you know, the, all of that stuff was written by rich white men, uh, uh, rich white cis, uh, cisgendered heterosexual men. And, and, you know, as a result, the, the, you know, at the root of these, uh, of, uh, of the United States is inequity. At the root is racism, sexism, classism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, that, that's at the root. And so all of the institutions created thereafter, like education, like law enforcement, like all of these other, like, like housing, um, you know, all of the, the, the institutions created thereafter were created to uphold those inequities. And as a result, damaging people of color, indigenous people, literally killing us, uh, literally erasing us from the curriculum. Um, and so, 
the the you know like i said literally killing us so it's important to organize or else we'll die if we don't organize we die we've had to or we had to organize to breathe to breathe clean air a lot of our communities just like my community that i said is historically redlined uh and and has a history of, of this institutional racism we have some of the highest pollution rates in all of california right and 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 these neighborhoods consist primarily of black and brown people right so we we literally had to organize to breathe i always like to go back to like the black panther party for self-defense you know they they had it going on if there was ever a revolution if the if the government was ever toppled or anything like that they would have been good why because they already have programs that met people's basic needs whether it be housing whether it be clothes whether it be food whether and all kinds of other things they already met all of those needs because they organized so that's why our, all, all the work that all of you are doing here that that we're doing in pomona is very important we have to organize to breathe we have to organize to live y'all organizing is very important thank you all very much thank you so much for sharing that and what's really interesting about this panel is that we are um very intergenerational we have literally from a 17 year old to a 70 year old um right on this panel and so that makes me feel really good about ensuring that we um that we pass the movement on down and we keep it alive and it makes me really think about um, this notion this um our indigenous notion of the seven generations right um like a lot of and it goes back to what fabian was saying about um ethnic studies and education chicana chicano studies right where we need to be um, very knowledgeable about our ancestors, where we come from, um, and and all of the knowledge that comes with that. And then we need to make sure that we have in place a system to ensure that the next seven generations are also informed, right? And so this um, this panel right now is giving me a lot of hope and making me feel really good about about that. And so I'm going to bring that to to the next question, uh, which is, and, and I'm going to leave this kind of open for folks to just uh, folks on the panel to kind of just. Uh, you know, bounce off of one another, um, especially because I'm having an issue where, where my screen is kind of frozen. But um, the question is, is uh, how does being part of, sorry, wrong question. The question is actually, um, what advice would you give to the youth, right? Th those who wanna get involved in the youth about um, how they can find an organization to join. Like what, what should be the criteria that they use for how to join an organization? Uh, I'll speak on it a little bit. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry, did I cut somebody out? I'll, I'll. Uh, yeah, I, I do want to say that it's really important to find out what the organization is about. You know, when you invest time, effort, energy towards what end? What do you want to see on the other side of this struggle, right? Because the reality is that many times we join different organizations that deal with symptoms of a problem without really addressing the, the, the fundamental issues that are oppressing our communities, whether it be economic, social, political, cultural uh, uh, manifestations of, of, of what we would consider colonialism, right? So really know the, the character of the organization and what, is, what are its uh, political objectives. Thank you. I, I think that's really well said. I mean, can I jump in? Sorry. Yes. Um, the, um, that's absolutely true. And I think the other thing to do is to find organizations that you're passionate about and that um, that are part of, a, of, of something you truly believe in so that it, the work you do, whether it's, um, you know, taking, bringing coffee, bringing water, marching in the streets, doing whatever it takes, is, is, is done with passion and it's done from the heart. I think that's really important. And also keep an eye on um, the big picture of things, you know, um, make sure you're, you're uh, like Benjamin said, uh, knowledgeable about the organization uh, you're involved. Can it's I jump in? Well. Yes, please. Um, so like as a youth, being invited into CSO Core was very intimidating. I was very nervous and it can be hard. It's hard to, I knew nothing of the movement, like not as extensive as it was, but I'm a quick learner. Mm -hmm. But like as a youth, don't be scared. Your voice matters. You are very essential to the next generation of the movement. I've had so many people tell me I'm the futuro of the movement, like so many people. And that is amazing. Like I am so proud. And like 
a lot of these orgs have youth branches. There are youth versions of these big orgs. If you're intimidated, reach out to like look harder. There's student organizations, high schools. We're working harder to get high school to get med chats. So look for those options and ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. I was very confused on a lot. I didn't know a lot of household names of the Chicano movement. I barely learned who Ruben Salazar was like not too long ago. And I was embarrassed, but asking questions is how you get to where you are, how you help the movement. So Thank you for sharing that, Lucia. That also makes me think about how um, important it is as um, elders. I'm not quite like the elder elder, I'm not in between age person, but it makes me think about how important it is for us to embrace the youth that come in, right? A lot of times I, I have seen, um, you know, uh, leaders in, in, in different organizations be a little bit impatient with youth, you know, because obviously, like you just said, you, you come with an open heart, but not necessarily all of the knowledge. And so that reminds me that, that I need to be as patient and as embracing of every single youth that comes to me that wants to learn. And as an educator, you know, that's something that has been on my mind for a long time. But thank you, Lucia. You are definitely um, a, a shining star that, that we are um, really grateful for. So thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to share? I, I, I wanted to just because, you know, following up with uh, my comrade over here, Lucia, so she's uh, part of the CSO wing, <laughs> the youth wing, uh, you know, exactly what you said, uh, Sister Lupe, you know, um, wh whether you, you get involved with an organization that does or potentially doesn't have a youth wing, don't be afraid to even develop that area of work. That's what Lucia did, right? Lucia and her friends were like, you know what? Uh, we are kind of intimidated, but we feel like we can like bridge the gap between these folks. So let's let's go ahead and build that that other wing. And you know, like we're gonna say no. Like we're gonna tell Lucia no. You know, I mean, look, she's right here. Y'all know what she's what she's about. So we were like, we we can't be leading y'all. Y'all have to lead yourselves because that would be really chauvinist of us. That would be way too like. I mean, I'm I'm like in my 30s. You know, what am I gonna do telling a 17 year old what to do? You know, I think she understands what needs to be done for her generation. And if anything, she's teaching me. And just like you said, Lupe, you know, like sometimes we have to take a step back and maybe sit down at the desk, trade positions with the, with the youth and, and younger generations because they have a wealth of knowledge themselves. Maybe they don't know about like decades and decades of history, but they can definitely bring in new ideas, completely new ways of organizing. And that's when you, you, you join these, you know, when you join these organizations, you can even make them better. Uh, and I, I would also, um, to answer the question, you know, like how, for those who want to get involved, what could they do um, before joining an organization is potentially finding out like, what are they doing? You know, what are they about? What is their mission? Uh, and, and how long have they been organizing for? And what's their, what's their record sheet, right? Like, I, I know that um, a lot of us have been to different uh, organizations, events, and, and we kind of learn from their, their ideas. I've been to many of y'all's events and I, I've learned so much. And so, you know, it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to enter these spaces and go in understanding that we're gonna learn. Uh, but for anybody out there who has never been to an event, like Lucia was mentioning, you know, and, and you go in and, and feel super intimidated because maybe you don't know who Ruben Salazar is. We're talking about the 50th Chicano Moratorium. Maybe we don't know who who led up to this, this extremely important time in history. But you know what, like maybe you can show up and, and learn from it then. Uh, and, and looking up the organizations that may, make it happen, you know, like who are they and, and talking to them, you know, um, there's different ways that you can talk to people safely distancing, look them up when you get home, do whatever you can and, and see if you can get involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Jocelyn, go ahead. You're muted, Jocelyn. Oh, sorry about that. Um, if I can just say uh, really quickly uh, to the youth, I'd say go with a friend. I think it's really scary to join a, a new, or come into a whole new space, especially when you're completely new to all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and it can be really intimidating, it can be really scary. And so if you're there with someone, a homie, a friend that you already know, who's like, you know, just as passionate about this, like, you know, go ahead and bring them along. And even if it's someone who's not as passionate, right, have someone there to, to help uh, to support you, right? Like, this is something that's important to me. It's something that I want to look into. And, you know, please, please come with me, even if you don't, if you decide not to, like, stay after, I don't know, the next meeting or um, what have you. 
So I think that that helps like calm it down and also like challenge yourself to make new friends and to to get to know someone. And so through through organizing, I think I've, I've met what some of the most like long lasting like relationships, friendships, like camaraderie. Um, and so I think that like, you know, be open to those possibilities as well, right? Like, you know, someone who's completely like new to you, like might be the, like, the person that has your back like for the rest of your life. So, you know, wel welcome those opportunities as well. I, I definitely will say that I agree with you. I feel like the people that are in the organization I belong to, Union del Barrio, um, and also some other um, mass-based organizations I belong to, like the Raza Educators, I feel like I know I can count on them um, when, you know, when I'm in need and I also know that um, I can trust them. And I definitely feel like when I'm going to, when the pandemic is over and I'm going to have a, a beer and a taco with, um, with, with friends and family and familia, like I want them around. That's absolutely true. It, um, there's something about sharing that struggle, sharing that vision um, that makes you in some cases be even um, stronger than um, than some of your own blood relations, right? Because um, because we're in that struggle together. Something about struggling together just makes it makes it um, more real. Um, I'd like to right now um, welcome folks to to answer the following question. Um, the, and the question is really like, uh, why why are we a part of this movement? You know, what what is it um, that we are motivated to to fight against? I'd like to start off that uh, answering that. Uh, one of the one of the fundamental things that we learned when we got involved in the movement in the 1960s was that, and that came from the from the Santa Barbara in fact, uh, that there were many folks that were involved in helping us get to where we are, and so our commitment in being part of the movement and part of organizations was to give back. To help give back something that for the next for our, our current group, but also for the next generation, so that we can build a foundation that uh, would support our people in all the issues that we confront with uh, the, the people, of the country, and the way this this thing is run. Um, again, I'm I'm going to go back to the the whole thing about uh, organization is about learning to work with people learning to deal with the social dynamic that's involved there and develop some skills that you can contribute to the organizations. So <clears throat> what I think is most important is that once again, our successes of how we are uh, represented, uh, how people look at us is based on our work and what we do in our organizations. Uh, and, and, and I'm gonna repeat in my closing here that it's not always gonna work out folks. It's not always going to work out. It's a process. It's an evolution. Fifty years ago, I wouldn't have never imagined that where we would be today in a lot of things. And um, you know, I worked many years in my labor organization to defend our people and get access to good benefits and and, and good contracts. And um, the politics of the organization were terrible. You know, and that's a longer conversation, but what I'm telling you is that it's based on what we bring to the table and how we advocate on behalf of ourselves and our people and uh, and not to falter because people um, want to bully us or, or put us down or whatever. So my thing is that we have to persevere that. And um, so that's that's what I hope we can contribute by giving back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd like to to answer that one. You know, what what motiv what motivates us? You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I would say, you know, what what motivates us? You know, and you could always go back to to you know that famous saying by Che. You know that that a, that a revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. You know, uh, I know that this probably sounds corny to some people. You know, but it's true. Yeah. You know, and that, that that's why we do what we do. You know, the there's a lot of you know this society creates you know a lot of cynicism, a lot of negativity in people that even people that that think they're they're conscious and then they say stuff like you know oh people are bad or 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 what they that's what they teach us you know in, in the schools and in this society you know human nature is is selfish and all this stuff but that's farther from the truth you know human nature is communal you know we wouldn't have made it this far as human beings if we weren't communal and, and we didn't work you know in in, in cohesive groups or that 
So, so what guides us is, is that is that love for for humanity, that love for for the world. You know, I as a father, you know, I I think of of my daughter, you know, and I'm like, no, I want to leave her a world that she can enjoy, you know, and because the one that that is that they're giving us, you know, is one that might not even be here for another generation or two, you know, and that's because of capitalism. It's not because of human beings. It's because of capitalism. You know, which is which is rooted in what they they've done to us here and maintains itself off of keeping the rasa. I mean, in particular, maintains itself off of keeping the rasa ignorant and disorganized. And I mean that here in the southwest in Aslan. You know, so so what motivates us is 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 the truth. You know, and, and love for for our people. Or that's the, you know, we we want you know, we we have to you know. Uh, uh, you know, you have to feel that you're part of of, of your people, or that if you feel you're, you're something apart, you know, or you feel, uh, you know, because you have a better job or you you got an education or or whatever, or that, that you're better, you know, you're a little better, uh, then then you know it's gonna be kind of hard for you. But you have to feel you're part of the people, you know, whatever you are. If you have a better economic situation, good, but you're still part of the raza. You're still part of the the. You know the community that you that, that you came from, or that hopefully still live in. You know that's your people, or that and and so so it's that you know feeling of love, you know, and and that you want people, you 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 feel and you understand that that the average person that that is always shut out of of everything has the capacity to to think and has the capacity to understand, you know, as the and because we see that throughout history, right? the average regular person has that capacity. You know, they have the capacity to to decide for themselves what they want or what we want, brother. That you know, that's that's our history of resistance. That's what it is. You know, all these people that we admire, brother, and all the organizations and movimientos that came out, they were working class people, gente pobre, you know, campesinos, you know, trabajadores, you know, undocumented people, uh, uh, you know, barrios, you know, homies, y, y, you know, et cetera. There, there were people that otherwise are always shut out of of everything, but they said, you know. Ya basta, you know, I, I have a brain, you know, I have, I have a heart, I, I can decide, you know, and my kids, you know, have as much of a right to live a, a good life as the people on the other side of, of town or whatever, you know, or the people that, that control everything. So I think it's it's that that what motivates us every day, you know, as corny or cliche or whatever it may sound, is that love, that love for humanity, that love for the raza, you know, and all these things that we talk about, you know, Aslan, you know, Chicanos, you, todo eso, este... That's what motivates us. Yeah. I think Don Ayala like Yeah, I think uh, I think going on going on with it, with what Ernesto just said right now. I think it's important. One of the things that that like young people, uh, uh, I think, should be or should understand is that they shouldn't be afraid to learn. There's a lot of concepts. This society puts us in little blocks. Puts us in in first racial blocks. Africans, Chicanos, Raza, immigrants, workers, uh, professionals, etc. They, they they divide us. This this society is very good at dividing us, and we see this literally with 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 the actual with the with, with the government that we have in in power right now. And and that's not saying that the Democrats are any different. The Democrats are just sneakier than the Republicans. But I think it's very important for young people to understand that they should not be afraid to love where they come from and they should not be afraid to to seek knowledge to seek the truth to seek uh, as the more information because the more information you have as an individual the more knowledge you have as an individual the more prepared you'll be to make make decisions that are going to further not only your own personal uh, existence, but the existence of the people that you that you come from. We we are workers. Uh, La raza Chicanos, Mexicanos in the Southwest, what we call Aslan, are are workers. We understand that, but we are, we also understand that they that that we have been denied our fundamental right to our own culture, to our own history, to our own identity. And young people should not be afraid of that, and should not take what this society pushes at them and, and tries to make them uh, as they be somebody else that they are not, or try to erase history itself. Thank you. Thank you, Genaro. 
Uh, Lori, I just want to talk a little bit. Um, so I think, you know, what motivates me is, you know, in, injustice and the fact that it still exists, you know, uh, something that has always called to me, something that has always, you know, hit me in my heart is, is, is injustice and, and seeing people face injustices. It's something that has always broken my heart. And, and so, you know, growing up in Pomona, uh, you know, I thought Pomona was the best city to live in. You know, I thought Pomona was beautiful just the way it is. And then, and then I went to UC Santa Barbara for school and it completely changed my yeah. scope of things. You know, when I was living at UC Santa Barbara, I would walk five minutes and I would get to a beach. I would walk five minutes, I'll get to a park. Here in Pomona, you walk five minutes, you get to a you get to a train tracks. You walk five minutes, you get to an empty lot. And you know, there's right here, there's a park by my house called Tony Serta Park. And that park hasn't had picnic tables uh since the 90s. We have MLK Park. That park hasn't had any programming for more than 10 years until I brought a program this past year. Uh, that that park was so uh, you know ill-maintained, the city did not take care of it at all. It got to the point where where there was there was folks who were able to actually live in the restrooms. And at one point they were arrested and they had pounds of drugs in the restrooms. Wow. They were selling them. Right. And so going back to Tony Serta Park at that park, that's the park that I referred to that that it 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 it, it, it um it, it's inside a, a historically redlined and segregated neighborhood. And you still see those effects today and so if you look at the restrooms at that park they resemble restrooms in segregated mexican schools from the 1930s the same they look the same without any restroom stalls none of that without any trash cans none of that um to this day uh you know soccer leagues go there so so the the neighborhood is black and brown the soccer leagues are are, are black and brown right there aren't any water fountains to this day, right? So it's like little things like that that really, you know, you know, just me, like with my education, like seeing things differently now that, you know, it, it, it's not, it, it, it's not out of coincidence that there isn't a water fountain there. It's not a, a out of coincidence that there hasn't been any programming at these parks in, in South Pomona for a while. It's not a coincidence that, you know, these restrooms still resemble the restrooms from segregated Mexican schools in the 30s. It's not a coincidence, right? We're still dealing with the same issues that we've been fighting against, right? Mm -hmm. We're still fighting. The more, you know, history does not repeat itself. It's been this way the whole time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you so much, Ja. Can I comment, please? Yes, of course, please. So since everybody's commenting on the youth, I want to emphasize my personal motivation and CSO Youth Core group's motivation were five females, young, millennial, Gen Z females. So I want to comment on the flip side of teaching the youth. I'm also here to educate the elders because Chicano and Raza culture, despite being as progressive as it is, it's historically racist and homophobic. So I'm here to educate that we need to be accepting, we need to assist other, like our sister orgs like Black Lives Matter, that's extremely important. We need to be present for our LGBTQ plus community because queer Chicana and Chicanos exist. So as much as I'm here to learn, I'm also here to educate. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Is there anyone else who would like to, to respond? Lupe, I'm not sure if you froze, yeah, but I, I wanted know, to- Yeah, I'd like to say that. Compa Ven. Compa Desiree. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Um, so what motivates myself, I guess, as an individual to continue organizing and to, to have participated in the first place in my search for an organ, a political organization, um, simply put, is because we're not free, right? Um, and so until we're free, that's when the organizing and the resistance and the struggle towards liberation will end, right? And even then, there comes a different level of organization to maintain it, right? Um, and so as a, I, I think to speak a little bit to um, of what Lucia uh, has pointed out, right, as, as a queer young Chicana, um, I think that's part of what, what Mujeres, it's our responsibility 
to contribute towards that other world that we see as possible, right? Because we believe it, it's possible if we if we recognize that our skills are not our own, but they belong to our community, to our people, right? And we have to take an active part in contributing towards that. Um, we see ourselves also as an extension of the Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s, which we've gained a lot from. And at the same time, there's rectification that needs to happen, right? And, and in order for us to actually really learn from those lessons and the shortcomings of different sectors of our communities, whether it be the queer community, whether it be mujeres, um, we need to play active roles in, in contributing and structuring and shaping that, that other, that otro mundo, right? It's free socialist society that we see as the answer as Union del Barrio. And so um, that's, that in short is why, what inspires me to continue to, to organize because until we're free, our, our work isn't done and it's our responsibility to, to contribute and take part in, in struggle. Thank you, Compa Desiree. Um, Benjamin, did you have something also? Yeah, real quick. You know, I think what uh, motivates many of us is exactly what Compañera said, right? Because there's oppression, because our labor is exploited, we're discriminated against, we have a uh, colonial school system that doesn't teach about our history, so we reproduce the same uh, colonial contradictions uh, because tens of thousands of our people in concentration camps known as prisons, uh, our people are being uh, locked up, right? And, but over time, as we engage in the struggle for, for freedom and, and, and liberation and self-determination, we begin to also understand, you know, I think what people have already said uh, is this question of a different world, a different society that uh, many times because of the capitalist media, because of the capitalist system, they portray as though this system is, is, uh, is permanent. But if you go and you leave and you explore other societies, uh, you know, for, for me personally, you know, uh, going to Cuba, going to Venezuela, Nicaragua, you know, I, I became uh, very consciously aware that another world is not only possible, it's already happening. But because of the, the, the sick, terrible, parasitic capitalist system and its drive to control the, the, the world's resources, it, it can only survive through permanent war, right? So we evolve in our understanding of society in, 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 in the relationship between oppressor, oppressed, slave, master, and, and, and slave, right? That our struggle is really a contention for power. And so you know, we do aspire to build enough political power to overturn this wretched, horrendous capitalist system so that another world can, so that, so that this world can survive and another world can, can be possible. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to all of the rest of the panelists for, for being here today. Um, this has been extremely um, uh, motivating, and inspiring, and and uh, and powerful, and and I just I think it's a perfect place to um, to end with the fact that 50 years ago we were saying no to the war in Vietnam, and today we're saying no to the war against all of the nations of the world, no to the blockade against Cuba, yes to education, yes to self determination, yes to um, our freedom, and yes to solidarity with um, with all oppressed peoples of the world. We hope to see you on August 29th, and we also hope to see you tomorrow at five o'clock for our third webinar. Thank you all so much, and have a, a, a blessed and uh, beautiful rest of your, I think today is Saturday, <laughs> Saturday. Thank you, and goodbye. See you tomorrow. Okay. Stay well. Viva la raza. Viva la raza. Viva. Que viva. Que viva. Que viva. Ha, ha, ha.